this roundtable involves um, Max, who we've already heard from, Stephanie Lyon, uh, who just spoke, uh, Olivier Berger, who is uh, – I can introduce him if I can get the, uh, the right document <laughs> up for you guys um, – who's a researcher at uh, Téléphone de Paris. Um, and he specializes in the field of uh, free, libre, open source software in general, and more specifically on software development processes and tools used in the free, libre, open source communities. Um, so he's you know, been a contributor to the OSLC CM implementations for Mantis Bug Trap Tracker and Fusion Forge Tracker. And also joining us in the roundtable is uh, Mike Fiedler, who is a uh, a co-lead of the Eclipse Leo project. So, everyone, I have one really simple question, and maybe other people have been asking it. So, why are there two contributions? How did this come about? Mike, maybe you can you can start with it. Start with that a little bit, and then go on from there around the table. Sure, Sean. Um, I mean the uh, the idea. So what, basically what happened was that you know, these two contributions were developed uh, independently of each other and were both brought to the LEO project pretty much at the same time. And we decided instead of you know, trying to um, you know, hash through or unify them or, or whatever, um, at the time we would just contribute both of them to LEO and uh, you know, go ahead and develop them there, see what the community interest was and you know, let folks see which ones fit their use cases. And I think that's really the key is that the, the two different um, contributions we, you've heard about today really fit uh, two separate use cases. Um, I'll let the authors talk a little bit about the particular use cases that they were targeting, but, but that's really, you know, the difference and the reason why we decided to take two and just see what the, the interest in them was and, you know, what sort of contributions we got going forward. Max, do you want to talk a little bit, you know, real briefly about the use cases that you were shooting for with your module? Yeah, again, it was uh, uh, the products I was trying to interface with was ClearQuest and Clear or ClearQuest and uh, Team Concert. So, right to uh, to the IBM Rational tools that support OSLC. Right, right exactly. Um, I, you know, I I tried to look forward to at least with the layout of the modules to provide other possibilities for other tools to go into them. But at this point, those are the systems I have to interact with. And, and right. things out. Yeah, Max is a release engineer, so he has to use you know, these types of queries every day, you know, day to day, and help his users uh, do these queries as well. Whereas Stephanie was coming at you know, more from a research project point of view. Stephanie, do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of use cases you had in mind when you started the project? Yeah, the, the, the point of uh, departure was really to be able to use simple defects, the simple defects best tracker, which is an open source back tracker. So I just had to write an adapter, and uh, Olivier just proposed to use OSLCCM to make it more generic, to be able to use it again for uh, with other bug trackers, for example, Mantis, which has an OSLCM uh, adapter. So that that was the main idea behind it. So um, as for the 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 use cases, it was just to be able to interact with backtrackers, so everything actually. Okay, yeah, excellent. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're interested in in the LEO project is, you know, what sorts of enhancements might we want to make to these Perl modules going forward? And I know each of the authors, you know, spoke briefly during their, their presentations about the, the areas where they they think enhancements could be made. I, I think I'd just like to revisit that quickly and maybe give other folks on the call today some ideas if they're they're thinking about possibly participating here, making their own contributions, or you know, even offline making con um, enhancing these tools. Uh, what sorts of areas they might want to take a look at for each of them? So I guess I'll I'll kick it back to you know to Max first and then to Stephanie. What what areas do you feel? Um, you know, people might want to look to enhance your module. Well, I definitely uh, think the uh, there'd be a use case for executing predefined queries, and the uh, other case would be uh, obviously creation of new work items. Mm -hmm. uh, th those would definitely uh, 
I, you know, I would think most people would want those eventually. I just haven't had had the need for them myself. Uh, right. So you, your scenario has been mainly just reading the change management requests, queries, and simple updates. Uh, and uh, beyond that, uh, I find the RDF a little bit tricky, in my opinion, to <laughs> to take to, to convert into something that you would use in Perl. Uh, I feel like the, what I did with using XML Simple was usable, but not great. And I'm not sure, sir, if there's some uh, other RDF style module that provides a better Perl, Perl vision of the of that kind of data. Okay, yeah. thanks. The, the RDF things that I read seemed more kind of addressed to a larger data set than, than the data you get back from, from maybe one work item or, or change request record kind of thing. Okay, excellent. And Stephanie, how about your module? Where do you see? I, I think it's probably pretty similar. It's you know the areas of cr creation or or pushing. But, but if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there will be the the first phase, and also some back fixes, more testing with other implementations with other back trackers that could be useful to be able to push to create bugs. And uh, to make it more generic, as I told, as I say about uh, the change request class, that is not very flexible. So just improve that. Um, I don't ask about the RDF processing. I, I, I've got, uh, I've been through some problems also <laughs> in Perl. So the, that's why the RDF processing is not that good and a bit slow, I think. Okay, so it sounds like the RD, finding good RDF libraries is a potential challenge. Yeah. So, uh, Olivier, I, I just wanted to ask you because you're you're also the um, I guess the 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 vision the vision guy behind behind the work that Stephanie did. You you were her um, I guess faculty sponsor. So where where else do you see this going? Uh, the, the NAT OSLCCM module, and I guess the overall work that you, you know, this is a part of. Um, I guess, kind of, what are your thoughts on on what's next here? Yeah, I think that um, uh, so it was mainly an experiment on our side. As you understood, Stephanie is a student, so we didn't expect her to produce a really uh, uh, industrial product at the end of her um, project. Uh, but I'm very pleased that uh, her contribution was. Uh, uh, made, made its way to uh, Leo and so that uh, people can improve it, uh, hopefully. Uh, but then um, my main um, uh, focus uh, in experimenting with OSFC in Perl here with uh, SD was to try and tackle some interoperability issues. Uh, and the context is the open source communities where most of the time uh, contributors happen to work on different projects. So SD basically allows um, developers to clone locally uh, many different um, bug, uh, bug uh, sets that uh, are stored in remote Bugzillas or Mantis or Jira or whatever. And so the, this interoperability challenge in uh, making sure you can connect to different uh, brands of uh, uh, trackers is really something that I want to, to work on and I hope uh, that uh, we can improve the situation. So um, by providing some Perl code here, I think we can hope that uh, it... Um, uh, somehow uh, creates uh, more momentum uh, towards uh, interoperability uh, through OSLC and maybe that's uh, also the kind of uh, nice features uh, that developers will like and uh, it will be um, some uh, new motivation to implement OSLC. Uh, I would say we have a kind of uh, chicken and egg problem uh, because at the moment, uh, if you don't provide um, um, such an interoperability option as OSLC, you have to implement lots of different connectors. But then, uh, if you look at uh, open source bug trackers, there are not so many that implement uh, full support for OSLC on the server side. So it's a bit in between now. Um, we, we, we got some good results with uh, Stephanie's work, but hopefully it's not uh, featureful. Uh, more work is needed, uh, probably more uh, extended uh, support for queries, as uh, Max mentioned, and then maybe only will it be uh, usable by real uh, developers, 
and maybe that's uh, motivation for Bugzilla to uh, adopt OSLC maybe, or um, Jira, or other bug trackers. I think that's some excellent insight, Olivier, on the chicken and egg problem. I mean, we tend to be in the mode right now in, on OSLC and, you know, writing adapters for these tools, whereas, you know, we should all be encouraging them to, you know, adopt it natively as well. Um, so the, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to ask a, a follow-up here. Uh, Olivier, are you, have you seen or are you, um, are you aware of interest from other Open source projects in what has been going on in, in Leo, whether it's the the um, the Perl contributions we're talking about here today, or the OSLC for J libraries. Um, do you, when you I know you you talk about it a lot, but uh, are people starting to get more interested in this? Um, <laughs> it's difficult to say. I've been uh, um, very uh, talkative about OSLC in all places I go. Uh, for a few years now, but you know, um, in open source communities, bug trackers development is not really something very fancy. So it is. It happens that uh, people use need bug trackers, but actually, no one really um, wants to spend too much time uh, maintaining their bug trackers. They have uh, other projects to develop. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, interoperability is not uh, uh, a priority in most of the case. People just have their tools, it works, and that's basically it. And um, still, as OSLC implements standards like uh, RDF and the uh, REST APIs, there is some hope that uh, maybe um, there will be more interest in the future and people will um, be... Uh, disgusted by re-implementing all over again new connectors, new uh, plugins for new tools. I, th I think maybe uh, progress on uh, Mylin support of OSLC would be also something interesting because people would be able to connect uh, their um, bugs list directly from the IDE, which would be very much interesting for most developers. So we'll see. Yeah, some interesting areas where uh, where you know work can be done and um, additional effort made. Uh, we do have one question in the chat. Um, then I'll open it up if there's any other questions before we conclude for today. Um, there was a question in the chat, Stephanie and Max, asking if you, you both mentioned difficulty in you know working with RDF. Is that specific to the, the XML serialization of RDF? Have you seen any other RDF libraries for Perl that support things like Turtle or, or other serialization formats for RDF? Or did you only really um, investigate the XML? Um, I assume I just started with RDF XML. And the main difficulty was just to find a module that was working or that I could <laughs> <laughs> and I could use uh, a module I understand I understood how I, I could use it, uh, but I guess maybe with the JSON it would be easier. So okay. I don't know. I, I, I've been using the try module, not the total format as uh, as Steve is suggesting. So I don't know more. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and I didn't. Uh, <clears throat> I did a little looking, but uh, I didn't <clears throat> do hardly any experiments. Uh, okay. I saw the ones that uh, Stephanie used, but did not try to figure out how to use them either. Okay, so so a possible area for additional investigation for folks that might be interested. Yeah. Okay, I guess Sean, you want to throw it open to any other questions, or go ahead and conclude for us. Yes. Yeah, well, th thank you, Mike. I'll pause for a second if there are any other questions that come through on the chat or on the phone. Otherwise, thank you so much for the good discussion today in this in this roundtable, uh, Olivier and, and Mike and uh, Stephanie and Max, and also thanks again, Max and Stephanie, for your presentations earlier today. Thanks to everyone who joined on the on the phone for this presentation today. Thanks to everyone who has watched this on YouTube. I hope this has been helpful, and I hope you will all go to eclipse.org slash leo, L-Y-O, 
and uh, take a chance to learn a little bit more of these. Probably the best way to uh, get a good look at these modules is to follow the link from the Quetzalio homepage into the Git repository and then just take a look at, at the code that, that's there. There's nothing, nothing better than code to understand what some software actually does. And read the readmes. <laughs> take a look at the readmes too. And also, we will uh, we'll take a chance to record a, a demo from Max and make that available as well, so that that can also be um, a, a little sample of how you might be using you might make use of the Leo Dash C module. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, thanks to all our presenters, and I hope you will join us again on Halloween. We are going to have a uh, a presentation by Mike Fiedler discussing uh, Eclipse Leo 1.0. It has been available for some time now, and we're going to take a, a look into what's in there and uh, maybe how it's being used and what's next for it, too. So I hope I will see all of you and uh, two or three of your friends on October 31st at, uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and I know Europe will have moved off of daylight time at that time, so um, I guess it's 3, 3 p.m. GMT.